And uh, let me introduce our presenter. Becoming Nikkei. Becoming Nikkei. A cross-cultural comparative study of diasporic Japanese Dikasegi Christian communities in Japan, Brazil, and Peru by Gary Fugino. So Dr. Gary Fugino is a professor of diaspora studies for Missional University. He served as a missionary church planter to the Japanese diasporas with the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. Gary co-edited and co-authored the EMS 20 monograph, Reaching the City, Reflections on Urban Mission for the 21st Century. He has published on cross-cultural identity and mission in EMQ, what is this? UFM, and other publications. He currently resides in the Chicago area. So, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, please welcome Dr. Gary Fugino. It's, it's also a great pri privilege to be uh, sharing with you today. But I, I do, as I'm setting up here, I do have a confession to make, which is that I, I'm a fake. I'm a fake Japanese. I can't, I can't say that I'm a real Japanese because I wasn't born in Japan. So I'm actually a hybrid. I was, I was born in Canada. And so my testimony is actually that um, my passport is from Canada. My ethnicity is Japanese. But my culture is American and my citizenship is in heaven. So I am, I am definitely a hybrid um, in many respects. Um, and so the thing, the thing about that that's a, a very significant for me personally is just that, um, and some, some people have already mentioned things along these lines, but when, when I'm in Japan, I'm called an American because I don't bother to tell them about Canada because that's too confusing. Um, and then when I'm in America or Canada, I'm called Japanese. So, you know, the, the word that I've settled on is what the name of this presentation is, which is Nikkei. And that's defined here in your book if you uh, wanted to take a look on the first page. But it basically is the definition of Japanese of, uh, or whoever you are, actually, whatever country you come from, a people of Japanese descent. I'm not going to go through the whole uh, presentation because it's too long. There's too many, there's too many things here. But um, I just wanted to let you um, I, I just want to read the, um, the definition that's listed here. It says at the beginning that um, a person or persons of Japanese descent and their descendants who immigrated from Japan and who crea created, the, that word is very important, unique communities and lifestyles within the societies in which they now live. Nikkei also potentially encompasses people of part Japanese descent to the extent that they retain an identity as a person of Japanese ancestry. This is also important where it says retain an identity. So even though you may never have heard of the word Nikkei, if you want to just look at this very simply, this is about identity and how identity affects the gospel, particularly in areas of things like evangelism and church planting. But my specific focus is on the Japanese. And I think also in the second paragraph, right at the beginning, it says, Nikkei community refers to social works and institutions. And then in the third paragraph, it says, it is based on a common worldview entailing culture building and was always by definition interactive with the host country. So when you think about Nikkei, most people will use the word Japanese and that's okay. I define that in here and I basically say a Japanese person is a Japanese Japanese as we call it, not a fake Japanese like me, but somebody who is born in Japan and comes from Japan. And even that is subject to interpretation, especially when you have people who are from Japan living in other countries like Brazil, Peru, the United States, whatever, who maybe identify more with their host culture now than from where they came from. 
So it's a very, very fluid. I think the word fluid is a very good way of describing this. And uh, let me just add a very small side note, but uh, in terms of the program as it came out, the, um, the people groups the, that, were that were put into here were uh, the Chinese and the uh, Indian people, as well as the Japanese. And I want to say that even though I am an outside insider to Japan, I am not a Japanese Japanese, I'm third generation, I count it a great privilege, even though I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I guess I am. I even have a hard time talking about this now, but I guess I am kind of in representing the Japanese people, but I was a, Jap a missionary to Japan, so it is a foreign culture, but the fact that Japan is included here as part of this discussion on the diaspora is so encouraging to me as a missionary, as somebody who comes from that background. Because, you know, with China you have 1.3 billion. With India you've got about 1.2 billion. You know, that's about one third of the whole world. And here is little Japan, which is half the size of the United States, and yet you, you care about the Japanese diaspora. And I'm so excited about that because um, many people have encouraged me over the years as a missionary and they've said, you know, uh, we pray for Japan, we love Japan, and I'm so glad to hear that because many people believe, and I do too, that if Japan becomes more Christian, if more people get saved, um, you know, they are the second largest unreached people group, that Japan could have a huge impact on the world. So at a consultation like this where we can talk about such an important group of people, I counted a rare privilege to be involved like this. So let me move on to um, some of these other words here. Um, just for the, word, for the sake of discussion, I am not talking about the Japanese in Japan specifically as much as I am talking about this word here, dekasegi. This is also defined in your book, but de deru is the Japanese verb for go out, kasegu is the Japanese word for um, make money. And so it's a combination of these two words put together. Dekasegi means people who go out to make money. And the word that you would probably most easily use would be migrant workers. That's the word that is used nowadays. Now, you may be familiar with the fact that um, over the, the past decade, or a couple decades actually, within um, Japan, Japan has actually created a new law in 1990 that was called the Immigration and Reform Act which allowed people of Japanese descent, specifically from Latin America, to go and immigrate from their own countries into Japan to work in the car factories and other places, electronics factories, where they needed workers. They specifically allowed people who were of Japanese descent. I think I may have even fit into that category, even though I'm not from uh, South America. And so it was through that that there was this huge movement of peoples that went from Brazil to Peru. And uh, with that, um, now there's a, a very large indigenous population of people from Brazil and Peru that um, are living there, close to 300,000 people. I think the Japanese number is around 270 million or 270,000, and with the Peruvians, I believe it's somewhere around 300,000. So over, combined, it's over 300,000 um, people. But because of time, what I would like to do is just begin with the end. And these are the missiological implications that are at the end of my paper, because the beginning part is really the details. And so I've, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on the um, beginning with the um, definition of terms, but I really want to focus on some of the missiological um, implications that I found through my research. Uh, one of the biggest things is, is how identity is defined. And I'm borrowing from two other sources who have gone before me. One, her name is uh, Nobuko Adachi. She's a Japanese uh, scholar who spe specializes in, in Japanese studies. Her focus has been specifically on Japanese diasporas. And so in 2006, she actually wrote a book by, uh, by I think it was Rutledge, that came out that was focused on them. Very good book. Uh, survey of the whole, not, not just in Latin America, but Japanese as a whole. And the, the things that she uh, boiled down, I gave you the definition of Nikkei earlier. The way that she boiled it down is, it's a combination of historical factors, so the Japanese immigration, if the Japanese had never left Japan, if Japan before that had never opened up to the Western world, then there would be no uh, Japanese anywhere. And that's a historical factor. There's external factors within the society, things like exog um, exogamy or end uh, endogamy, okay, or things uh, such as racism 
or educational levels, many external factors. And then there are also internal factors where things are going with, for example, the way that people perceive their identity or the way that people talk about their identity. And this is a huge thing that will factor in also. Along with that was another uh, book that pioneered these studies dealing with the diasporas by uh, three authors, Hirobayashi, Kikumura Yano, and Hirobayashi. And they uh, broke down the identity and the way that communities form uh, with, for the Japanese, the Nikkei, as being defined by the home nation, which um, could be anywhere. It could be, you know, I'm from Canada, but I call the United States my home. Then the second part is Japan. There's always this connection to Japan in terms of identity. And then thirdly is how the Nikkei community is formed. And as, as Adachi points out, there are many different factors going into it. So what I did was, based on their, their um, paradigms that they laid out in their works, and then also in terms of my own field notes and the participant observation that I did over a several year period, going back and forth between Brazil, Peru, J Japan, also into the United States, into different places, I came up with this kind of model. It's, it's a little bit uh, wooden, it's a little bit clunky and I'd, I'd eventually like to work it a little bit more, but this is how I see it and it, it factors in the things that they have and I've added in a couple things of my own. Um, you, for some reason the, the screen is cutting off part of the uh, diagram there, but if you look in your book, the, the picture is there and on the left side are most of the things that Adachi factored in. But then what I included was a more uh, local community and this is dealing with the larger in group that, that are outgroup pressures. So for example, this would be within Brazil, people living within Sao Paulo, or within Peru, Lima, or in the rural communities perhaps. The, the Japanese are famous for the way that they pioneered and farmed the Amazon. They said it's farmland that only a Nikkei could handle because they basically reclaimed the land in a way that nobody else was able to do. Um, so there's huge expectations. Then you have the local society's perception, and this could be something different. So you could have the way that Brazilian people look at Japanese, but then within that, within a specific area, there's this place called Moji das Cruces, that is a sub, well, it's not a suburb, it's more like an outlying town. It's about 45 minutes from the center of Sao Paulo. And in Moji das Cruces, the, almost half of the population is Nikkei, and the mayor is Nikkei. So the way that they're going to view the Japanese in these areas is going to be much different than in areas where there are no Japanese or where people have only heard of Japanese, although it's still within Brazil. Then you have um, transition where it's talking about things like movement between generations. And this is something that's been done a lot in missiological literature with different groups of people. The one that I'm most interested in because there has been a lot of similarities that I've seen has been with Korean Americans and others who have tried to adapt within uh, the United States culture. And because I, I see a lot of commonality for that with my own Japanese experience. And then the bottom part would be the pioneers, which are the Issei, or the first generation. And the interesting thing about the Japanese as a group, a people group, is, is that they have been um, changing. Um, there, there's actually more than one generation of first generations, if that makes sense. My grandfather was a first generation, but a whole bunch of first generation people came to the United States again, who were totally unconnected to the existing Nikkei community in the United States in the 1990s they came. And now there's still another new generation of pioneers who are coming. So this cycle moves on and repeats and changes and flexes all the way through. And then finally, in the middle right here would be the individual, where you have a, the in identity formation, which comes from a number of different factors. Certainly there are internal psychological and sociological factors, but also there are uh, these outer factors or these historical factors or even the geographical factors or global factors that are, that are pulling in and affecting um, the, um, the, the, the formation of that individual, whoever they might be. So on the left side, in the smaller box, I have a self-derived consciousness that's related to Japan. And this is fascinating. I don't have a whole lot of time to go into all of the details of this, but this goes back to the beginning of the, the definition of a Nikkei is a lot of it has to do with both the creation or the construction of an identity and the way that you define yourself 
as a person. Uh, one of, uh, uh, and I'll show you this in a second, but there was one man who said, I am not Peruvian. This was in Lima. He said, I am not Peruvian. I am Japanese. And I don't have a picture of him, but if you had looked at him, if you're thinking stereotypical, he does not look like a Japanese at all. But in terms of the way that he perceives himself inwardly, he is Japanese 100%. He's actually third generation like me, too. So he doesn't even speak the language. He only speaks Spanish and English. Okay. On the right side here is outwardly imposed stereotypes, where in every society, and this was also fascinating for me personally because I had always considered that uh, a Japanese is a Japanese no matter where they are and how they're perceived, but it's very different. Even between the three uh, major countries that I was involved with, which the United States, Brazil, and Peru, very different perceptions of the same group of people because, of course, the context is different and the history is different, and the experiences of those people within those contexts is so different, and it's almost, I, I, I would say, almost like a no-brainer, and yet it totally surprised me. And then finally, in the middle, would be the core identity. I use the word amalgamation because um, there are many different terms out there. This is my term, and I'm not saying that it's even a correct term, but I, I look at it as an amalgam, that there's a combination of all of these different factors that pull in and bring out the identity of the person who is there. And this is coming from both inward and outward influences on all the levels that I just explained. Now, how does that work itself out? In, in Brazil, the word that I came up with from my research there would be basically fusion. Okay, sorry, this keeps jumping on me. I'm not sure why. Um, with fusion. So the way that fusion works is kind of how you think about it, which is that um, it's a combination and a melding, I would not say melting with a T, but a melding with a D, that it's a joining of these things without a complete loss of either of the identities. Within Brazil, this is, I've seen, I, I noticed this as we were coming, that going through Chinatown and other places as we were driving up from the airport, that the, this is common, but you'll never see this in the United States. You'll never see this in, a, in, in Japan, actually. The only place that this is in Japan is as the entrance to a temple. This is over a major road in Moji das Cruces, the area that I told you about right there. So there's this melding of, of Japan and Brazil that are together in that area. Then the next place would be Peru. And if you have your, your um, uh, book, and you look at the, the section on Peru there, the, um, I'm not like, it, it would be probably easier for some people to see if you look at it, but if you look at this top photograph right here, this painting, this is actually the original. It comes from um, a TV show in Japan that's no longer going, but it was very popular called Nippon Mukashi Bunashi, and what it is is it's Japanese fairy tales. And, the, the thing about it that's very interesting, and this speaks to the Japanese side of things, is how the Japanese view people, and they're, they're very famous for this, but all of the cartoon characters have wide eyes, big eyes, okay? The way that they're created from any anime or manga or cartoon, anything that you see from Japan that's made in Japan, big eyes. But look at below. This is, this is created by Rolando, the, the man I mentioned earlier, who doesn't look Japanese at all, but calls himself Japanese as a Peruvian. This is by his mother. She was doing a painting. This is a little hobby thing within the senior home that she was in. Oh, and he took me to this huge uh, Peruvian senior's home for Japanese citizens, or, or people who are Nikkei. And so she just did this as an artistic project, recreating this picture right here with her own brush, which is, and it's very good, it's a very good representation of what's above, but notice the eyes, okay? This is how this woman perceives herself in Peru, okay? And I, I, I was so sad because I met Rolando, he was my guide, but I didn't get a chance to uh, meet his mother because she was doing some activity and she was away when I was there. I really wanted to see what she looked like because he was so proud of his Japanese-ness and being Japanese. But obviously, just looking at that picture, you can see how she was the same way, that she felt that pride of being Japanese. And that's how she is defining herself in terms of her identity. Then, within Japan, I visited a number of these factories and uh, factory towns 
where the Brazil, Brazilian, Peruvian, and other people were working within these areas. This is very typical in Japan, where you'll see signage everywhere that basically explains for you the things that you need to do. And it gives directions and stuff like that. But the thing that is really interesting about this is, is everything that is written here, it's written, first of all, in Japanese and Portuguese, okay? Because all of the workers at this particular plant were from Brazil, but they have them in Spanish, too. This one is in Portuguese. Everything in there is about rules, about things that you should and should not do. And Japan is very much, if you've been there or live there, you know that it's a place where it's very important to stay orderly, to follow the rules, to do what you're told, to do it exactly the way that you're told, and stuff like that. And you can imagine the clash of the cultures between the Latin culture of Brazil and this culture within Japan and how they come together. Like one of the small things, but a very big thing is, is that Brazilians eat late and they work late. So they get home generally around 10 o'clock, they eat around midnight, and they party until about three or four in the morning. And then they get up and go out again. So they bring that lifestyle, okay, from Sao Paulo or Santos or wherever they came in to this small town outside of Nagoya, and they're, build, they're building cars, and then after they're done, they party. It really upset the neighbors. Okay, the people who are, who are around there. And, and this was not just a one-time thing, but it continued and went on. So the word that I, I used to define that was built around this, word, this idea of polarization. Then, along with that, I am so sorry, I'm not, my, my thing seems to be possessed here. Um, so I'm following here Dr. Enoch Wan's taxonomy, but I've just adapted it. Uh, I don't think that this one is in the, uh, uh, in the paper, and I apologize for missing that. But it's, it's pretty much following uh, what he said in terms of he's breaking down the different kinds of um, diaspora that are out there. And I think with this one on this side, if you, because you can't read it, let me read it to you. But it says, to, through, beyond the Japanese, long stay, permanent residents, returnees, and dekasegis. These are very important uh, terms with the way that the, um, the Nikkei and the diaspora works because it's dealing with people, for example, who are, are permanent residents or who maybe overstay their visa illegally but are within the country for a long time. It also deals with, on the receiving to Japan side, Japanese people who come back from other foreign countries, who come back from England or come back from business in China and this is, this is not from a business trip, but this is from living abroad for two or three or, or years or longer. And then you also have, from the sending side from other countries, the Dekasegis, who are entering into Japan for the first time, perhaps. This is a very, very interesting, um, this is also in your, uh, in your folder there, or in, in the book. But this is a very helpful thing that was put together by a Japanese pastor. He has a PhD in biochemistry, but he's a pastor and he's an excellent sociologist and anthropologist. I had, I had a great time interacting with him over a couple trips. But what he did was he basically broke down the situation in, Bra in Brazil in terms of perceptions and identification of self within Brazil generationally, historically, and contextually. This is a very, very helpful thing. This was all in Portuguese, and he translated it into English uh, for me. But this is like, um, l let me just go through parts of it just very quickly. But in terms of identity, OK, these are from the pioneers who left Japan and entered into Brazil right at the turn of the 20th century from 1908 and forward. Their identity, in terms of how they called themselves, were Japanese. But then, by the, by the second generation, they're, they're trying to create what's called the Japanese Brazilian, a Japanese with a hyphen and then Brazilian after it. And then my generation would be within this 1963 to 1980 generation where it's talking about uh, Nikkei Brazilians. Those are people who are no longer Japanese, but they are Nikkei, if you go back to the thing that I said originally, and they are also Brazilian. But then, look at this one, the fourth one at the bottom there. Very interestingly, it flips. And now they are Brazilian Nikkei. Nikkei does not come first, 
Brazilian comes first, but they still remain, retain that Japanese part of their identity. Finally, at the bottom is their Brazilian with Nikkei Ness, or Nikkei Roots, okay, to them. And I've encountered many of these people where I made the mistake first when I met them, they, some of these were living in America, I said, oh, you're, you're a Japanese Brazilian, and they said, no, I'm Brazilian. You know, that's, that's it. You know, there's no hyphen, there's nothing after that. That's the way that they looked at it. But um, along with that, this is how they look at their whole culture, okay? For the first group of people who define themselves as Japanese, they see themselves as strangers, strangers in a strange land. But by the second generation, there's a dualism. And I can very much relate to this also from my own family background, where my parents were encouraged actually not to speak English, or sorry, not to speak Japanese because of the war. That, and there was extreme prejudice even before the war toward the Japanese. They were told not to speak Japanese, and the, the parents, as much as possible, tried to communicate with them in English, even though the parents couldn't speak English very well. But by the third generation, by mine, there's this double uh, non-citizenship, he calls it, and what it is is you don't belong to Japan, and you don't belong to wherever you are. You're just kind of there. But then, by the next period right there, it's a non-native Brazilian. So you are Brazilian, but you're just not from Brazil, so to speak. Nobody's from Brazil, just like nobody's from America, but that's how they define themselves. And then finally at the bottom, it's a type of Brazilian with an ethnic consciousness, not even the word Asian or Japanese used within that. So this is one man's, um, you know, design, and, but I think it's a very good one and a very uh, accurate one in terms of Japanese specifically within Brazil. And I have Peru and, and other things that I could show you, but because of time I'm not going to dwell on that. I just wanted to show you the Brazilian one because it's very obvious and big. So let me flip through some of these, but how do we deal with this missiologically? The way that I look at this is specific to Brazil with a fusion mindset is what Paul did when he was um, writing in 1 Corinthians, where he talks about being free from all men, but being all things to all men so that he may all, by all means save some. I see that within Brazil, where there's a willingness, like a, a great willingness to adapt without syncretizing, without moving too far into contextualization. Well, sometimes some people did, I, I will admit that from what I saw. But overall, most people were very, very uh, conscious and um, mindful of trying to keep themselves you know, clearly Nikkei, but at the same time, they really wanted to be Brazilian. So it was that fusion of cultures today. One of the most interesting examples that they did was they had the, um, they moved the Obon Festival, which if, if anybody is familiar with that, that's the a festival that celebrates the ancestors, those who have died. In Japan, it's in August. They moved that, specifically in Brazil, in the area that I was in, in the Sao Paulo area, into November. Why? Because that's the Day of the Dead in Latin America, at least in that area. So they adapted that, they contextualized it. That's a fusion. That was one of the biggest things that I saw within um, Brazil. It doesn't mean you compromise the gospel. It just means that you're dealing with it in a different way. Then uh, with <laughs> this thing, okay. Um, then with Peru, I see a very strong thing about embedding. And what I mean by embedding, and this is a small side note that uh, I, I included in my notes there, but with Peru, there was a very uh, bad history with the Peruvian government and the Japanese government. When, when uh, Japan declared war in the United States, Peru aligned on the side of the United States. And they basically blamed Japan for a lot of problems that were going on in society at the time. And so, to make a very long story short, uh, at the beginning, there was huge persecution and discrimination against the Japanese because they were Japanese. But then what happened is, is the, the Peruvian government tried to make it up for them. So they actually built them a Japanese cultural center in the center of Lima and did a lot of different things. But what happened with the consciousness and the mindset, the identity of the Peruvian Nikkei is, is they had no desire anymore to be Japanese. So many Peruvians would begin, began intermarriage, like intentionally. And they would stop using Japanese or stop being interested in anything Japanese intentionally so that there would not be persecution or discrimination and so that they could adapt and become as Spanish speaking and as Latin as possible. So for example, in Brazil, I was able to talk with many people in Japanese as well as in English, but in 
Peru, I was able to speak to very few people in Japanese, only English. And that was a reflection of that embedding. But within, within the scriptures, you see examples of that. I've only pulled out one, but one is Ruth, where Ruth basically abandoned her culture. And yet, because a Moabitess basically became a Jew and followed everything that was embedded within the culture of the Jews or at that time, we have Jesus having foreign blood in his lineage, right? And so you see that within the, the Peruvian culture there, where there is that embedding of identity, and, and they pick, like Rolando did with the, the gentleman that I was telling you about, his mother, he picked Japanese, even though he doesn't look Japanese, and he's, he's definitely only Spanish speaking, not Japanese speaking. But there are other people I met in Peru who would say they're only uh, Peruvian, and then there were people, other people that I met who said they're only Nikke, you know? So it was a really interesting thing, but it, it goes back to that whole idea of how we perceive ourselves and how we let people define ourselves at times. And then with Japan, um, I think the, the diaspora itself that's in the scriptures is a great example of polarization because the Jews, wherever they went, they were not welcome. They were, they were told that you know, you're Jewish and you're different, and they experienced that for thousands of years in the different places where they were dispersed. But even within the scriptures, we see that with Jesus, uh, the mention of people saying, he's not going out to the dispersion among the Greeks, is he? And then, of course, in Acts chapter 2, you have the great dispersion in Jerusalem, where you have all the, the, the uh, pilgrims coming to Jerusalem for the feast and then leaving. You know, by the end of, book of the book of Acts, I don't know if you've ever checked this out, but... Acts chapter 2 starts, Jesus gives the command in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, right? In, in Acts chapter 2, all of the Jews are there, and, and uh, they're, they're there temporarily, but the apostles are supposed to go out, and they don't. And so by, it's, it's really easy to remember, by Acts chapter 8 verse 1, 1 8, 8 1, they're scattered. God scatters them. There's this, that's a very specific diaspora. You see that in the Old Testament, too, where the scattering is done under judgment. And yet, through that, God used that as a witness to spread the gospel, because later that's where Paul went. He went to all the synagogues, and that's where he, sh that's where he preached a lot of the gospel, right, when the church was first beginning. So there's a place for all of these different things, because we are fearfully and wonderfully made, okay? And one of my favorite verses in terms of identity and, and stuff like that is in Isaiah 43, verse 5 and 7, where it says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Everyone is called by my name and whom I create for my glory, whom I've even formed, I have made. He has made us the way he is. I love what Bishop Tendero said yesterday. I like the way that I am. I'm glad I'm a Filipino. I like the way that I am. I'm glad I have a, a hyphen after Japanese, however you want to call me. Okay? And so I, I think that God has made us specifically in the way that we are because as humans, we are constantly changing. And our focus is so much on our identity. But I think that our focus really has to be focused more on the Imago Dei. And it is as we are comfortable in the Imago Dei that we find stability in our identity. And I'm sorry, it keeps jumping. And a confirmed identity both culturally and within Christ because the Imago Dei is something that doesn't change. Identity can change. Identity is fluid, it's flexible, but not the Imago Dei. All right, I'm out of time, thank you.